Um, we've got two uh, extra people here. I wonder if it would be just useful just to um, just briefly introduce yourself. So, David, in the first instance. Okay. Uh, can you hear me okay, folks? Yeah, thank you. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Fantastic. And this chap's birthday. What an amazing day. <laughs> what amazing stories, amazing memories. It's a fantastic, yeah, I think he's actually around the house. Well done. Brilliant. Fabulous. Uh, my name's Dave, Dave Brind. You've probably seen me painting and inviting other people to paint up at the back on, on Craig's um, wood blocks and on his, well, his book plates. I'm going to show something which I think has happened today, which I think is really special. It's a lovely piece of cloth now that I think we've produced in Stevenage, and that is an aim of why we're here. And it's going to be difficult to, to sort of point out, really, but um, what we have is a, rend a rendition of one of Gordon Craig's book plate designs. They're usually designed very small, and we've painted them a lot larger, sort of as, as a scenic scale. And I'm going to point out a couple of bits, because I think this is really, really important, and this cloth is now interesting. Um, this is the Lord Mayor's bit, just here. OK, so he's had a go at this one, just there. And then Ewan, the... Um, the young boy has had a go down here, and then Bonte has had a go over on this side. So we've got this cloth painted by lots of other people, and we will finish this off and we'll send this down to Hillary, who's somewhere up the back, I think, somewhere, uh, and make sure that the other two that we painted actually come back down to Stevenage, and maybe with uh, the inclusion into the exhibition or whatever, we'll tidy them up a little bit as well. But uh, we really wanted to have something going on at the back that was very much to do with Craig, his designs, hands-on, larger scale, um, but very much involved in his early-ish woodcuts. And these woodcuts, these, thank you, these um, book plates were um, really a way that Craig could um, earn some early money. Um, he's 26, 27. Uh, when he's producing these, so that he's also getting to grips with the theatre design, the theatre work. And so this is some sort of bread and butter money. It's interesting, Harvey, talking that right at the end that he didn't have much money. Um, yeah. And uh, to start with, he's struggling a bit, and we know that Ellen bell bells him out quite a bit. Yeah. But the book plates actually produce some early money. So we really wanted to th think book plates, and we actually really wanted to think this was partly how he started. I mean, he was taught very, very well how to engrave and cut into wood. So again, I know some of you have seen it, but if you do get a chance before we put them away tonight, have a look at the copies up there, because they are superb of what he was doing. Uh, that's sort of me. Uh, um, having said that, I've been a scene painter at the Opera House in Covent Garden, Library Theatre in Manchester, scene painter at the Barn Theatre down in Small Hythe for probably about 15, 16 years. Uh, very lucky that my dad actually worked for um, Edie Craig in 46, 47. Uh, and I was born in Tenterden, very close to Small Lyons. So a lot of really nice connections and got to know a lot of lovely people about Craig over the last 20 years. So I'm a real Craigite in terms of enthusiasm, uh, but I'm not a Craigite in terms of academic. I like to get my hands dirty. I'm not saying you don't, <laughs> but it's just really nice to be here. Thank, Thank you. you very much, David. Thank you. Um, so I think that's an opportune moment to throw it open to the floor if anyone has any particular questions. I have a number of questions myself, so I'm, I'm more than happy to be greedy. But uh, if anyone does, that uh, here, now is a good opportunity. Oh, yeah, we have a question here. Hello, hi. Margaret Brett from Steve... Oh, OK. Margaret from Stevenage Floral Arts Society. Um, I go down to the Royal Opera House regularly to see ballets, and um, the scene painting seems to be a much smaller part of the... Uh, of the scenery nowadays, there's so much electronic and um, lasers and, and shows. What, what's your opinion on this? Uh, well, you go, yeah, you go, oh, okay. I've got one. Yeah. Yes, it's uh, the truth is that uh, Craig did not like technology in any form. Uh, in his book scene, he talks about lighting in relation to uh, pens to write with, how the world used reed pens and feather pens, and then somebody invited, invented the typewriter. 
and he didn't like the typewriter because it was the, the printing of the letter, the appearance of the letter was away from the action of the hand. And he wanted, uh, he didn't want anything like that. In other words, what we would call today automatized, uh, anything that was away from actual usage of the hand uh, and, and you could say the body, he, he didn't like. Even though he was interested in the Uber marionette, uh, yet still, uh, it could it was would conceivably be controlled by the hand. He even figured out, and this makes people think today of uh, com the computerized world, but it isn't in his terms. He imagined an instrument like an organ, where he could play the movement of the screens, and then of course it wouldn't be away from his hand, like, like a musician, like an organist. But, and then also um, uh, an idea that he had that I actually put into practice was moving the screens uh, when they, uh, the invisible side of whichever screen or combination of screens it was by actors. That an actor could do an exit, let's say, behind a screen, or that the screen had moved to mask the actor from any spectators, and then that actor, continuing the rhythm and dynamic of his movement, could move the screen so that the scene would take on the dynamism uh, of, the, of the actor. And in that sense, a kind of play between acting and seen where there was there was nothing removed or static or automatized. So when you ask about uh, all these devices and means, I think it was what he already didn't like when they were hardly underway, like back in the twenties. Yeah. Thank you. Can I add just one small bit to that as well? By all means, David. Is, there is, a, a, and going on from from Craig and scenery, there is on the scene painting side of it. There's, there's a point where um, there's a, a scene painter called Joseph Harker. He was actually towards the end of, of the amazing time at the Lyceum. Um, he was, yeah. if you like, known as, as, as Irving's scene painter. Yeah, I remember and, and, and reading you know, about him. Yeah. And um, he was an extraordinary painter. In fact, that company only uh, uh, fell over um, probably 10, 10, 12 years ago. It was going right up until uh, yeah. a very short while ago. But he has, um, Joseph Harker doesn't like Craig because he thinks he's going to stop all this lovely painting of trees, lovely painting of forests. And as we saw earlier with Chris, all the Venice scenes that are going on. And so Harker really has a go at him and says, you are going to lose us scene painters and prop makers lots and lots of work. And, and Craig just sort of dismisses him off and says, well, we have to move forward, and yeah. my stage will be empty. And it is, his stage is empty. And it's certainly on and they talk about the visions. But there were scene painters of the time, people like Hawes Craven, uh, Telbin, who were creating really elaborate sets. And they are getting worried. They are getting worried. I mean, some of them actually disappear by the time Craig starts to make uh, real movements in the theatre. But uh, they're getting worried that they're gonna lose work because Craig's ideas are going to say, we're going onto a white stage, uh, we're just gonna have the screens. Yes. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna paint? But it doesn't, ultimately it doesn't work. So there's room for lots. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you. Any other questions? If I might be so bold, Harvey, am I, I would like to ask you a question, um, and it may be a simple answer of no, and I will take that. Um, but did Craig ever mention Adolf Appiah? Uh, so Appiah was a Swiss uh, scenographer, theatre designer. Uh, I, we know that Craig and Appiah had letter correspondences with one another. Um, this is something that in terms of the history of theatre design is seen as quite significant, particularly in the way in which both Appiah and Craig principally communicated their ideas both through language but also through their drawings. Yeah. And their drawings were extraordinarily powerful. Um, I ask this because Appiah um, founded 
a theatre building in the middle of a garden city in Hellerau, just outside Dresden. Um, and it was part of a new town development in very much the same way that uh, Stevenage was influenced by in those first few years, um, back in 1975, um, in terms of when this theatre was built. I just wondered if he had mentioned Appiah. Um, Not to me, but I'm very aware that uh, uh, I had to answer a question in Birmingham. Uh, a student said to me, who did he feel contemporary with? And so I had to think, and I think I could think of only three people who he felt contemporary with, though they were at different times. Uh, the, f the first, the earliest, was Isidoro. The second, the middle one, was Adolf Appiah. And the third was to crew the mind. I don't think he felt uh, on, the, on the same level with anybody else. That's my, my feeling. Even though he admired other people, admired actors, actresses, uh, I don't think he felt that, that total three musketeer kind of teamwork, except with those particular ones. Indeed, one of the very early uh, American theatre historians, Kenneth McGowan, he went to an event in 19... McGowan, yes. yes, in, in 1922, and he went to an exhibition of uh, European uh, innovations in theatre design uh, in uh, Amsterdam, it was. And he came back and wrote with a uh, preeminent uh, theatre designer a book uh, called Continental Stagecraft. Uh -huh. um, and uh, within it, he basically lords Craig as everything. Um, and Appio is, is there as well. But Craig spoke at the event, I think, and Craig was a very uh, impassionate person, whereas Appiah was a very, very shy and retired person. Um, so their contrast of personalities has always been fascinating for me. Um, but well, Kenneth it, uh, McGowan uh, became the, I don't know what title it was, but like head of scenography at Fordham University in New York. I was never a student there, but I do know people who were and were very, very... Uh, driven by his teaching and also his, his push towards Craig, which came out very strong in his teaching. And Robert Edmund Jones, of course, who was the, uh, the theatre designer that I mentioned, uh, he went on, and uh, particularly in New York in that respect, uh, not in the same way that we saw at the Cambridge Festival Theatre, but taking on some of the ethos of Craig. Um, again, I wouldn't necessarily expect Craig to have name-checked him, uh, but uh, it's interesting that you, those three contemporaries that you cite, uh, with uh, uh, De Clue being the last, um, I think that's quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, and about De Clue, very little is known, because we're so much later. When we hear about Craig, we hear about the earlier times, but uh, 1945 on, uh, we don't hear much about it. We just think he was retired, mm. but he wasn't all that retired. That Catherine. Oh. It's just making me think about um, what Edith Craig is doing in the 1920s, which people probably won't particularly know about. Uh, and she's um, art director at the Leeds Art Theatre in the early 1920s. And one of the plays she puts on is um, a dramatisation of The Secret Agent, by Joseph Conrad. So if you're an avid TV drama watcher like me, you'll know that that's been, been on recently. Um, but the Leeds Art Theatre was described in terms of, um, well, the Leeds Art Club, which was uh, connected with the Leeds Art Theatre, was talked of as um, the uh, centre of modernism in the north of England. And Edie Craig is at the centre of this. And the, uh, Michael Sadler um, was the um, I think vice chancellor of the University of Leeds at the time, who was leading uh, modernist art and also supporting um, uh, people's interest in people like Kandinsky. And there's a very interesting, I think, Ukrainian artist called Jakob Kramer, who was involved in the Leeds Art Club, and he actually did a portrait of Edie. Uh, Craig, and I, I know that because Donald Sinden years ago uh, told me ab about this painting. But um, in the 1920s, Edie is involved um, in uh, amazing productions at Leeds, but also uh, the Everyman Theatre, Hampstead, and she's also becoming interviewed um, in the as a, uh, Yorkshire Evening Post interview, and she she refers to um, her interest in. Uh, drama in churches, so she's putting on um, uh, drama in churches, including um, Hugo von Hofmannsthal, the Great World Theatre, 
that's put on in Leeds. Um, and she's also very well known as a, a um, pageant organiser. And you probably know that Virginia Woolf's last novel between the acts, um, uh, Miss Latrobe, the, the village play pageant organiser, is, is said to be based on, on Edith Craig. So there's, um, in these interviews, uh, there is passing mention. I think she's rather reticent when she's being interviewed and, and not um, putting herself forward as, as an innovator. And she sort of likes doing it, but doesn't really like talking or writing about it. But the interviewer is, is kind of extracting the information from her. And she does talk about um, uh, a comparison with Max Reinhardt. So that, that's um, one sort of uh, point of comparison she makes. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions? Well, actually, do you have, oh, of course, of course. I'm Marion from Steenridge. Um, we've, I've never heard of the Uber Marionette before, and um, because I didn't know that much about Gordon Craig, I guess, was it used, or was an Uber Marionette used in his plays? We've heard a lot about them, the concept, but did it actually come to fruition? Were they used? Well, Craig, Craig meant bringing the actor up to the level of, of an artist in a new way where his or her own body and voice would be the medium. And the fact that there were excellent actors uh, and actresses who did all sorts of things, for him that wasn't that. In fact, something that I used to look at, and then I found a reference to it in a list of things belonging to Craig, was a book of reproductions of paintings by the Italian Renaissance painter Piero della Francesca. If anyone knows his name, he, uh, he did frescoes, which are in, I think, Vicenza, Italy. And these are very good reproductions of, of the images. It was Craig's book. And he had written inside, on the inside cover, the painter of Uber Marionettes. So if you look at those figures, they, they tell more than I could do just by talking about what he means. And I think if you have never heard of the Uber Marionette, uh, the best thing you could do is to read Craig's essay and see what it does to you. Uh, because it has meant so many different things to so many people. Most of it negative, uh, but uh, I think that's the best way. Thank you. Hello, I'm, I'm Jackie from Stevenage as well. Uh, I'm interested in uh, Craig's father, uh, Godwin, and I've been doing some research uh, about him. And he was a very respected man in his own right. He did a lot of designing and uh, furniture making and, and things like that. Um, I'm wondering to what, I, I believe that uh, Craig was influenced by his father's work when he was a young man. And I'm wondering if you've got any particular uh, piece of work that you know that Godwin did that you could uh, point out and say, yes, there is a connection here that we see. Uh, I, I no? must say, I could hardly hear. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, so it was, it was a question about Craig's father, Godwin, and whether or not there was a connection between any of Godwin's pro uh, practices and that of Craig. Godwin was a well-respected uh, designer. He designed furniture and textiles and costumes for some of Ellen Terry's plays. And I wondered if you felt that there was a piece of work of Godwin's that had an influence on Craig's early thinking. You mean it would have an influence on Craig's thinking? Uh, and on his thinking and on, on, on his stage designs yes. and things like that. Well, uh, I know one story, in fact, I even thought I would tell it, uh, which 
is an impression I have because I do think that his connection with Godwin, especially the architectural connection, is, was very important to Craig, even though he, uh, perhaps he had never met Godwin at all, or if so, when he was a baby only. But Craig, at a young age, went to see a Greek play uh, des designed, practically directed, I think, if you could call it that, by Godwin, at Hengler's Circus in London. Now, I have no idea where that was or what it became, but it, was a, it wasn't a circus. It was a sort of theater. It, it probably had facilities for being a kind of arena theater. But in any event, Craig saw the play, and he writes in his book, Ellen Terry and Her Secret Self, he writes that there was a long, low stage. Uh, he said, but the eye of the spectator could go up following the high lines above the stage. And he said that he thought to himself, that's original. I'll inherit that. And he did, indeed. Indeed, there are such images uh, among his, the images. And uh, I know that in his magazine, The Mask, he republished essays. Uh, I think it's, they are called, it's a series. They're called Architecture and Costume in Shakespeare's Plays. And they're by Godwin. And just a small one on the side of that as well, that if you go to the Manchester City Art Gallery, if you're passing through, they do have some fine examples of two of the chairs that he made, just to look at as, as, as fantastic piece of craft work. Um, quite extraordinary. Um, but there were two that were out um, of his furniture. Yeah. Oh, we have a question here. Hi, so I'm Scott Palmer from the University of Leeds, um, and I'm interested in, um, well, first of all, I'm interested in the way in which you're making links between Appia and Craig, and also thinking about what Chris was saying earlier on this morning about Craig's indebtedness to the limelight men of the, Lyce of the Lyceum. And also I'm thinking about Appia's own um, fascination and education about theatre through his work with uh, the German lighting uh, engineer, um, um, Bear in Dresden. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in, in thinking about the influence of light on both of those practitioners, and yet the claim that, that Craig didn't like technology. And of course, light is didn't like what? technology. Oh, yeah. And of course, light to, to be an expressive form on the stage re relied upon technology. Of course, light is about the revelation of the body and about the revelation of form and architecture. So I'm really interested in whether or not. Um, also, in terms of Appian and Craig, both of them uh, didn't really realise very many practical productions during their lifetime. And I'm wondering whether or not you sense in your time with Craig whether there was any frustration that his work wasn't, hadn't been um, produced on stage, uh, particularly after, in his later life. Well, the thing is, Craig had a, a, an idea that he developed in working with models, and uh, it was that lighting would change totally and not have a technological spirit, even though you could say, well, a building has to be built that's already in, in a, partly technological in its context, but with the lighting, he wanted an evolution like nature, like night turns to day, day turns to night, but not a light for effect. And I think for him, that was already getting away from technology, even though you might say, well, after all, it used equipment that had to be built. It still is, is different. If the light is changing, not because the play requires this effect or that effect, or blackout or a new scene, but rather just a, 
constant, imperceptible continuity. I think that's more what Craig would have meant. And he, he certainly never said that he was against lighting. But I do feel that in some of his ideas expressed in the designs and in his writings, you can see a, a different kind of, uh, of continuity, uh, like music, like, a, like, a, like music. But music become in visual and concrete and surrounding instead of just audible at a distance. And I, I think for him, that, that's where it went wrong. Well, that's where it went, really. I know that I myself was surprised at some things he did that I thought were more technological, like the um, projections that he used when he went to Denmark and made scenic backgrounds with projections according to the work of a, a German, may, maybe you know more than I would about him, Lindbach, Adolf Lindbach. He was very impressed with that. And uh, you could say, well, that's technological. I think also there's the fluidity of those projections and light that's the key thing, rather yes. than the equipment that, that creates that, them. That kind of continuity uh, where, uh, where for lights, it wouldn't just be that the lights are hung or whatever they did with them, but that they are uh, scaled. They're on a scale. Like when we hear music, we hear a note that is part of a scale. Well, I think that's how he wanted the lighting to be. I even have some uh, writings, unpublished writings of his, in which he says that in so many words. Thank you. Also, it's very similar to Appiah then, in terms of thinking about the relationship between music and light. Well, certainly, Appiah was the only designer who he felt, as I said, yeah. felt together with. The famous meeting in 1914 on the station as you. He felt like Appiah. Even though you would say, well, it looks like Craig. But he felt Appiah was not stealing from him, no. which he thought that other designers were doing. Because Appiah had published before, almost before he was born. <laughs> Appiah had already published for a long yes, time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I actually have a, a question again for yourself, Harvey, but also possibly for yourself, David, although we didn't get to talk about this, so maybe a bit okay. of an out, okay. out there question. Um, before we uh, started today, Harvey, you get that, uh, the tale you just uh, told, me, told us collectively about um, the long, thin stage. Yeah. Uh, some of the things that have been said about Craig is that he maybe wouldn't have been that uh, positive towards a effectively end-on proscenium stage, although uh, the stage here isn't quite that, it may be very much construed as that. However, it is long and thin. It's quite a, it's quite a wide stage here at the Gordon Craig Theatre. It's not that deep, uh, but it's quite wide. Are you talking about the stage here? Yes, the stage here. So you have some, you staged a well, show I here in 1980. when uh, someone said that, uh, that he wouldn't... Uh, Yes. of this stage. Uh, he's, my father would not have approved. It was Edward Craig who wrote that to me. So, of course, I was curious to see this stage that uh, Craig wouldn't approve of. And when I saw... Well, no, I forgot. We're not on the stage. But, but the stage strikes me as having that quality, which you don't see everywhere, um, though it looked even more like that to me then. Maybe... Maybe something's been done to make it less low, is that possible? Maybe some tormentors were mm. hanging, I don't know. But the, uh, but I thought, this does look rather Craigian. And I remember saying it to the managers who were here, I don't know what their name was, uh, at that time, around 1980. And, uh, well, I mean, they just took it as so much information but because they knew nothing about Craig. It didn't mean anything to them. But it meant something to me. I, I, I thought, I have a feeling he might like, like it if he came in. Came into the theatre. Uh, David, I mean, in that respect, have you ever worked here? That's what, that was the question I was going to ask. It, it's a long time ago. 
um, of working for the Library Theatre, I do remember, I won't remember the actual name of the production, but um, the Gordon Craig Theatre asked us to produce on the paint frame that we have in Manchester, uh, for folks that may not know what a paint frame is, um, a lot of the continental painting of backdrops goes on the floor, on the flat. So uh, they call that the continental method of painting. Uh, if you're going upright on the wall, uh, they call that the English method. And so if you can imagine this wall here, with a frame going up and down, you can get to any part of the cloth or the backdrop to paint. Uh, this theatre didn't have a paint frame. I'm presuming it probably still doesn't. But, um, so they're quite specialised pieces of kit. You get them in Drury Lane, you get them, did have them in Covent Garden. Uh, there is a demise of, of, of paint frames throughout the land. Um, the Library Theatre, where it had its uh, base in Withenshaw in South Manchester, had a paint frame. So we actually got the call to paint over the summer some painting uh, ah. paint drops. And interestingly, they were on the sort of width of the screens, yeah. and they were a splattered grey and white. So they would have lit really quite interestingly from neutral light to heavy colours. And that was a week's work on painting drops that were then going to be put onto screens. But I can't remember the name of the production. This was 1980, would have been 1987, 88, somewhere around that time. Um, but it, I was very pleased to be painting then because I was already working at, at, at the barn and knew about Gordon Craig. So I was very, very keen to do that job for this theatre. So it was on the back of the name of production. It sounded as though it was okay. It was yes, okay. yes. I mean, it is interesting how the name Gordon Craig is certainly well known on the continent. Um, as uh, Chris Bohr kind of alluded to earlier, you mention uh, Gordon Craig's name in Poland or in Czechoslovakia or in Czech Republic now, um, and uh, they know who you're talking about almost yeah. immediately. Um, indeed, I've spent quite a bit of time in Prague, and when I say I was part of the Gordon Craig Youth Theatre, they are impressed, um, and they uh, nod in agreement, and I am better as a, as a, as a consequence. Um, so I always like to, to get that in there, and having acted on that stage in that respect it's quite a it's quite a badge of honor although if I say that anywhere in the UK I get a kind of blank uh, um, expression and I used to get that actually when I said I was from Stevenage uh, then the um, football team got promoted in uh, beyond the conference um, and all of a sudden people knew who's where Steve or they had heard of Stevenage they didn't necessarily know where it was um, sometimes they knew it as somewhere it was like Milton Keynes uh, but wasn't didn't have concrete cows um, but actually, I think in the, to, to sum up today's uh, proceedings, I think it would be useful uh, to go around uh, the panel that we have collected here um, and effectively answer uh, the question that we've set ourselves today in terms of who is Gordon Craig. But I ask this with a bit of a caveat in so much that we've got a number of people here from Stevenage. Uh, and when uh, people go home uh, or when they go and speak to their friends at another opportune time, and they say, oh, what have you done at the weekend? Oh, I went to a, a, an activity about uh, who is Gordon Craig? And they go, oh, our theatre's named after that. Uh, what would their response be when they say, well, who was Gordon Craig? What should they respond with? Am I OK to go with you first, Catherine? <laughs> Where to start? Um... Well, I think he was one of the most influential. Uh, he was one of the most influential uh, thinkers about um, innovation in the theatre in the 20th century. Uh, he talked about the art of the theatre. This is something which was really um, interesting. People across the world. It's in the period of modernism, which is such an important. Um, set of movements related to art, literature, sculpture, but also theatre, and he's at the centre of the new ways of thinking. And I suppose I'd like to add that he's also um, the brother of Edith Craig, <laughs> who was also a <laughs> very important 20th century theatre director. Harvey? Yeah, what I would answer? Yeah. Well, I think I'm lifting this from one of my own writings. Do it. But uh, I would say that he is uh, a, a visionary theater practitioner whose radicalism is so far going that the theater has yet to catch up with him. <laughs> I think that's what I would start with. 
it's a broad statement, but I think that's what I'd say first. Open for development there, isn't it? Yeah, kind of leaving, that third day hasn't maybe yet, it hasn't arrived yet. That's the, ah. the question. Uh, and then third David? Day, yeah. I'm, I'm going to answer it from a scene painter's point of view. I think that was that, that, that would be, be me. Um, I remember working at Central School of Speech and Drama, teaching scene painting back in 1990, 1991, with uh, uh, he's a professor dean now at, down at uh, um, uh, Winchester, but uh, Anthony Dean, and Anthony could not believe how interested I was in Gordon Craig for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, uh, partly because I was born very close to, to, to small highs and because I was very interested in Elsa Craig, the actual rock that um, Gordon and Edie are actually named after in the Firth of Clyde. Uh, and he said, well, it, it was, it, in a sense, it was the same sort of story, that he was someone who was um, not, very, not very good with scene painters and was, you know, just sort of destroying whole careers. And I said, but he is an amazing innovator and he's someone that we should really really look to. And it's interesting that the interest goes from strength to strength. It really does. Uh, I think a day like today proves it. And sitting over there painting and listening to everyone up here, from Catherine, Harvey, all the others, it's been a revelation today as well. And I know a reasonable amount about him, but it makes you realise how much you don't know. And so I think, yeah, I'm beginning to get to know Gordon Craig a little bit more. I wouldn't say I know exactly who he is. But uh, what a great day. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, David. Um, I think it's so fascinating to consider the argument uh, of what has Gordon Craig's legacy been in terms of contemporary theatre making in Britain today? And I think that, that is a very difficult question because we do have to admit that Gordon Craig uh, spent most of his life outside of Britain and either Craig didn't. And actually, there is an argument that maybe either Craig had a greater impact yeah. on the legacies of contemporary British theatre, but through practice and through graft in that respect, um, uh, than Craig immediately. And it is interesting, Craig name checks in Poland and um, uh, in, uh, all over um, Eastern Europe in that respect. Craig is a distinct and known name. Um, one of the interesting things that I came across in terms of researching Craig, but just generally in terms of the history of scenography, um, there is a theatre practitioner working today called Felix Barrett, uh, who founded a company called Punch Drunk. Um, and Punch Drunk uh, uh, do work which they describe as immersive theatre. And this emerged um, from about the 2000s onwards. Um, immersive theatre was a particular uh, form of language that uh, Felix uh, propelled in the first instance, um, taking the language of computer gaming uh, more than anything else. So when a person's playing a computer game, they're kind of the protagonist and they're walking around an environment, um, particularly based on early first-person shooters. So things like Doom. Um, this is, yeah, the Doom. Um, uh, and uh, he took that ethos and he create, created theatre where people would go and walk on the stage, but they would do so meaningfully and do so in a way where they are discovering uh, the dramaturgy, di discovering the drama in that respect, if not creating the drama for themselves, in a way that in many respects transitioned the idea of an actor. Although in uh, uh, um, Punch Drunk's work, uh, they are now an associate company of the National Theatre, uh, and they, their most recent kind of large-scale work, The Drowned Man, um, took place over um, four uh, levels in an old um, uh, post office building um, near Paddington. Um, I went to it and I cannot remember these things. Uh, but what, what, the reason I state this is that uh, Felix Barrett was asked as part of an Observer article um, a few years ago, who's your greatest influence? And he named Edward Gordon Craig as his greatest influence. And he took us back to a particular story of him as a, a, a student, um, I think in his A-levels, uh, where his uh, tutor um, did an exercise with them where they um, got underneath some blankets with some uh, kind of a flashlight in that respect or candle light was it? It was, on a, it was under a table in a sports hall and their drama teacher got, turned out all the lights and got to experience uh, the feeling of the play through the sonography, through the darkness and through light. I think that embodied experience which goes back to your uh, lovely story there about him being scared of the dark actually, mm -hmm. which also I think for me links to ideas of light and dark and how that, that impacts on Craig. Mm. Um, but clearly that's also had an impact through education, 
and Craig Olsen have been part of the A-level syllabus, although not very mm. often taught part of the A-level syllabus. But there you have an uh, idea of it, uh, national education, uh, a teacher who's able to explain